Really appreciate it. I wanted to know right now, we started out this year where the market was down. Things weren't going that well. And everyone thought, okay, here we are. The whole thing's starting to collapse at this point. And we see this slide going down, down, down. And then all of a sudden, we see the economy, not the economy, I shouldn't say the economy, I should say the stock market improve because all the other indicators are showing us something different. Has everything been fixed at this point? Is everything okay right now? Or do you see a completely different picture of what's going on? I do see a completely different picture. I, uh, you know, let's go back to the middle of last year. You know, all of a sudden we get to August and we see the greatest financial shaking that we had seen since the last financial crisis. Markets all over the world started to crash. Things went crazy. And then all of a sudden, you know, then the market started recovering, particularly here in the United States, although some of the markets around the world didn't really recover here in the United States. The stock market started to go back up. So people said, oh, you know, the crisis is over. Things are you know, going to be OK. Then we get to the beginning of this year, January and, and the very beginning of February. Markets all over the world start crashing again. It's even worse. And the markets go even lower. At one point, sixteen and a half trillion dollars had been wiped out from stock markets all over the world. But now markets have gone back up, particularly in the United States. Uh, uh, close, you know, uh, rebounded qu quite nicely. And so people think, well, it was just some temporary shakings, no big deal. The crisis is over as if the stock market's some type of barometer for the economy. But let's kind of go around the world and, and look at everything that's done. But let's start here in the United States. We just learned that retail sales unexpectedly declined. <laughs> Uh, last month, that was that was unexpected, but that's something we would expect to see if we were indeed heading toward, or had already entered a recession, which I believe that we have. In fact, uh, you know, the Atlanta Fed is projecting uh, GDP growth of zero point one percent. You know, other uh, uh, analysts have said, well, zero point two, zero point four percent, but right now they're projecting growth that's barely above zero. I have a feeling by the time the final number is comes in, we'll be actually in the negative. Our economy will be shrinking, um, but uh, it's not just retail sales. Total business sales have fallen again. Um, we're seeing the inventory to sales ratio has risen to the highest level we've seen since the last recession. In other words, uh, retailers, dealers, they're sitting on lots and lots of stuff that's not selling. And so what they're doing, they're, they're ordering less stuff from the factories. In fact, factory orders in the United States have fallen for 16 months in a row. We never see this outside of a recession. We're seeing corporate uh, revenues fall, corporate earnings fall. In fact, it's being projected that the, for this corporate earnings reporting season on Wall Street, corporate earnings will be down an average of 8.5%, which is definitely in recession territory. Um, so we're seeing all these things, and corporations are getting into trouble with their debt. Corporate debt defaults have spiked to the highest level since the last financial crisis. We're seeing uh, the average uh, rating on corporate debt has fallen to BB, the lowest level that we've seen, actually lower than at any point during the last financial crisis already. So, you know, all the underlying uh, uh, economic statistics, the economic fund fundamentals are just deteriorating. The, you know, our, the en en energy industry continues to fall apart. Dozens of energy companies have filed for bankruptcy. The U.S. oil rig count has fallen to the lowest level in 41 years. Um, you know, since the, the beginning of 2015, we've already lost more than 100,000 good paying energy jobs. So here in the United States, the economic fundamentals continue to deteriorate uh quite uh quite rapidly and yet because the, the you know the stock market has been doing pretty good lately people you know at least on a general level people are feeling pretty good about things but that's just here in the united states we can also talk about what's going on in the rest of the world is the rest of the world doing as well as the united states or do you see something a, a completely different picture out side of the yeah, United States. A completely different picture because all these numbers I just talked about were for the United States. But the thing is, is that right now, fortunately, the United States is pretty much doing better than almost everyone else on the planet. So let's take a quick look at what's going on around the planet. Let's start with down in South America, where you've got Brazil. They're the seventh largest economy on the entire planet. So they're a big deal. 
Well, in Brazil, uh, just a, a, a couple, a few weeks ago, CNN ran this headline, quote, Brazil, economic collapse worse than feared. So not only are they admitting what's happening down in Brazil is an economic collapse, but they're saying it's even worse than we thought. So should we and, worry that they're using the word economic collapse now in their reporting? Because it was really yeah, the only it, the alternative media that was using economic collapse. Now the corporate media is using it. Yeah, that, you know, and I made a big point of this in a, in a recent article. It's like, you know, when the mainstream media, when CNN starts using that in their headlines, you know, it's time to start paying attention. It's, it, to me, it's a big deal. And of course, you know, impeachment proceedings are, are moving forward with the president down there. Unemployment is skyrocketing. Crime's getting out of control. People are really, really hurting uh, in Brazil, but in Venezuela, it's even worse. And you mentioned economic collapse in the in the headlines. Well, in the in Independent, which is one of the biggest uh, news sources in the UK, they use economic collapse in their headline to describe what's happening in Venezuela. Um, and uh, basically, the 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 gist of that story was that what's going to collapse totally collapse first, the government or the economy? What's happening down in Venezuela is. Basically, we're seeing the end game of printing money like crazy, which we can talk about later in this show, what's happening in the Western world. But in, in Venezuela, uh, one measure of inflation is at 720 um, percent, you know, and this has led to food shortages because people get it, actually get some money. They want to go to the stores immediately and buy some food or whatever, because, you know, they just know that tomorrow or the next week, Prices are going to be even so much higher. So if they actually get some money, they want to spend it immediately. It's kind of what happened in the Weimar Republic in, in Germany in the 1930s. So this has led to severe shortages of food and basic supplies. So if you go to the, into the stores in Venezuela, the store shelves are bare. Uh, chaos and rioting and looting. Uh, you know, you basically got the gangs and the mafia are kind of taking control of things. It's kind of turning into the Wild West there in Venezuela as society totally unravels. Um, and, uh, you know, and so they're even worse than Brazil, but that's, you know, that's just South America. South America is essentially mired in this horrible depression, but it's just not South America. If you go over to Europe and, you know, uh, the problems in Greece, of course, are continuing, but Greece is only the 44th largest economy on the entire planet. Italy is the eighth largest economy. And in Italy right now, the banking system is melting down. It looks like virtually all the banks over there are going to, all the big banks are going to need a bailout. They just had an, an emergency meeting one week ago in Rome. And then they said, what are we going to do about the banks? How are we going to rescue the banks? So they came up with this ridiculously small, uh, you know, uh, fund to try to help them. And, and it's really, you know, not going to do much good. But um, but basically, we're seeing a banking system meltdown in Italy, which, which is the eighth largest economy on the planet. So if they had so much trouble fixing Greece, you know, what are they going to do about Italy? How is Europe going to save Italy, which is, you know, the eighth largest economy on the planet? You mentioned riots and inflation. Do you see what's happening down in South America happening here in the United States? I do. I do. Uh, you know, as things unfold, that things go down the road, because, you know, when people are hurting, when people can't feed their families, when people don't know where their next meal is coming from, when people don't have jobs and there's really no prospect of getting a job, you know, people get desperate. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, um when you combine that with the anger, the frustration, which are growing, which in recent years, a whole host of polls and surveys in the United States have shown um, anger and frustration in this country reach, you know, extremely high levels. So this is kind of bubbling under the surface. The general population is angry. We see it kind of in the in the uh, candidate candidacies of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, where people are wanting establishment, you know, uh, uh, candidates that are not part of the establishment. They're angry about what's going on in Washington, D.C. They want to do something. So they're like, give us someone else. Um, and you combine that with, uh, you know, how our borders are wide open, where we've got 
uh, people, you know, coming up through the southern border in particular, unchecked. And this has led to a uh, fueling of, uh, for example, the FBI says we've now got 1.4 million gang members living in our cities, major cities, 100,000 in the city of Chicago alone. This has been primarily fueled by in illegal immigration, which has been, uh, you know, fueling the growth of these gangs. Um, and then, of course, you've got the radical left with uh, whether it's the, the, you know, we've seen in, in Ferguson, Baltimore, we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen with, you know, these uh, protests at Trump rallies, uh, where there's so much anger and frustration from the far left. And, you know, all these factors put together, you know, basically the conditions are really ideal for some real, to, from, for, uh, civil unrest on a nationwide basis. All it's going to take is a spark. And of course, Trump is kind of providing that spark on a political level, but also as economic conditions really start to head downhill, um, particularly once the financial markets completely melt down, I think that people are going to get angry and frustrated and they're not going to, they're not going to act out in a responsible manner. Now we see across Europe and Japan, they're in negative interest rates right now. And we see here in the United States, they raise the interest rate. But you had an interesting article about the central banks distributing money directly to the people. At this point, I mean, is this the last bullet they have to shoot to say, okay, let's try this and see if see what happens. If we give money to the people, maybe this will help the economy. Do you think this is going to help the economy, them giving money to the people? Yeah, it, it, you know, just look at what's happening in Japan. They tried, you know, they, you know, go, they, they try to stimulate the money, the uh, economy through government spending. And now the debt to GDP ratio in Japan has been pushed up to 229%. They tried to uh, stimulate it with quantitative easing, you know, on a per capita basis, the quantitative easing over there has been far, far greater than what the Federal Reserve did here uh, in this country. And, you know, they try to stimulate it now but, you know, all that didn't work. The Japanese GDP has gone negative again for the second time out of three quarters, uh, you know, and industrial production just dropped to the lowest level since 2011, since the tsunami. You know, they're, 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 their economy is basically a zombie at this point. So nothing's working. So now they've tried negative interest rates. That doesn't seem to be working. You know, and, and in fact, there the, the Nikkei is down about 5,000 points from where it was last summer. It just dropped another 500 points last night, but that had to do kind of with the earth, great earthquakes that have been happening down there, particularly on the southern island of Japan. Um, but so now, you know, that what they're talking about in both Japan and Europe, they're saying, hey, maybe it's time for helicopter money. Maybe the central bank needs to start giving money directly to the people to stimulate spending, to stimulate the economy. But that just shows, you know, that, you know, for them to even be considering such emergency measures shows really how fragile things are, where they're just getting to the point where, hey, we're just going to print money and just start giving it to people, you know, where basically this is what the, I believe, the end of democracy looks like. The you know where we're how close to the end game we actually are, where they're talking about doing this, and of course you know we've seen things you know when when you know uh, just money starts being printed up and just being you know uh, economies being flooded with money. We've seen what happened in the Weimar Republic and what's happening in Venezuela right now. We saw what happened in Zimbabwe. You know it's just so foolish, but they're so desperate to 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 try to revive these economies where they're, it's not just in Japan, but in Europe, they're actually talking about, hey, maybe we just need to print up money and give it directly to people. And, you know, the, you know, and totally bypassing the government, in essence, you know, people seeing the power of these central banks, these unelected, unaccountable, uh, you know, bankers, central planners that have far more power over our economies than anyone else does. Here in the United States, people don't understand that. They keep asking these presidential candidates, what are you going to do about the economy, not realizing that the Federal Reserve actually has far more power over the economy than presidents do. That's, that's absolutely true. And you mentioned that we're coming to the end game here, and I'm getting the feeling the elite millionaires, they're starting to realize or understand that things are 
rapidly falling apart because you're talking you were talking about people leaving Chicago, other major cities. We have reports of uh, the rich building their own uh, runways in different countries so they can land their private planes. Uh, I think that was out in New Zealand. And we're understanding now that a lot of the elite millionaires are now, or I, sh I should say billionaires, uh, they're building underground bunkers. So what do they know that most of the people don't know? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, I came across this article in the Chicago Tribune, which said uh, in last year, 3,000 millionaires <laughs> left the city of Chicago alone just in that one year. And so I, I I always knew that the elite were, you know, fleeing the cities and, and this and that, but I didn't know it was on that scale. And over in Europe, it's actually worse. And the biggest city with, uh, that millionaires were leaving was Paris, France. 7,000 millionaires left uh, yeah. Paris, France last year. 5,000 left uh, the city of Rome in Italy. Um, and so we are seeing the, uh, the elite by the thousands leave these major cities and some are doing it for tax reasons but some are also concerned about the same things that you and i are concerned about that preppers are concerned about and uh, and in fact and they have the resources to build underground facilities or, or fly off to places like new zealand but there's also big companies one of them is vivos that are building these huge what are being built is ultra luxury survival uh, living quarters for the elite. And in particular, I wrote about this one in Eastern Germany, which during the Cold War was a Soviet underground facility. But they they bought this facility and they refurbished it and turned it into luxury suites and 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 places the elite can go. And so th this facility has five kilometers of underground tunnels and. And you can go if you've got a lot of money, you can buy a place where you and your family can go when everything on the surface gets crazy. They can go down there and they can survive for an extended period of time. But but and there's a market for these things. And so this company Vivos, they've got uh, facilities in the United States and in Europe, and there's a demand for them. And it's growing because the elite are scared. And, and Zero Hedge has, has posted an article about how the elite are actually dumping stocks right now. You think we've seen this rally, stocks have been going up, but the the smart money has been dumping dumping stocks into this rally. Um, and it's something like 11 weeks in a row or something. And so the elite are obviously concerned about what is immediately coming up on on the horizon. So do they know things that we don't know or are they concerned about the same things we are? But, you know, the, a lot of the elite out there appear to be quite alarmed about something. That is true. And as the system comes down, we see out in the Middle East and actually with Russia and the United States and North Korea, we see things are heating up in that arena and right now we have a ceasefire in in Syria. The United States and Russia are both discussing the ceasefire. And this has nothing to do with the Islamic State or al-Nusra or any other terrorist group. It just has to do with the moderate rebels. Do you think this ceasefire in Syria, because we've seen this before. I mean, we've seen, I mean, this is going back to 2011, uh, where fighting has been going on in Syria. And at this point, do you think the ceasefire is going to hold? Do you think there's going to be peace in this region? Well, not long term. I think this is a temporary pause. You know, we saw back uh, earlier this year, for, you know, lead uh, defense ministers from 49 different nations gathered in Brussels, Belgium, and the Saudi defense minister came out and admitted that at that gathering of defense ministers, see, it wasn't just from the NATO uh, countries, it, you know, that's the headquarters of NATO there in Brussels, but it was from 49 different countries. So that's much bigger than NATO. And so the all these defense ministers came and the Saudi defense minister admitted that a ground invasion of Syria was discussed at that meeting. And so just a couple days after that meeting, all of a sudden they had this giant military exercise in northern Saudi Arabia called Northern Thunder in which uh, you know, it was uh, billed as the largest military exercise in the history of the Middle East. So obviously that was discussed at that meeting. Um, all of a sudden, Turkey, uh, they start shooting across the border at the Kurds and so forth. And then there's this big push for a ceasefire. And what, you know why they wanted a ceasefire is because basically Saudi Arabia, Turkey, you know, have been funding and arming and supporting 
the rebels that were, you know, trying to overthrow President Assad. And for a long time, you know, as they were backing the rebels, it was working because what was happening is the, the, the Syrian government forces were being pushed back. It looked like that eventually the rebels would be able to overthrow Assad. And then, and that's what, of course, what Turkey and Saudi Arabia and the United States wanted because they were like, Assad will be gone. We'll set up a new Sunni government there and, and shift Syria because mo most of Syria is Sunni anyway. They're, they're something like 70% Sunni, something like that. And so the idea was to shift Syria into the Sunni axis of power, set up a nice puppet government over there. It would be friendly to the West. Every, everybody would be happy. Um, so that was the goal. And at first it was working. Um, and, and, you know, five years ago, they, they started organizing protests against Assad. They turned violent. The civil war erupted. Hillary Clinton was kind of the one that spearheaded this whole thing, you know, and when she was secretary of state from the, from the U.S. end. But, and so the plan was working at first, but then Assad said, hey, Iran, I need some help. The, uh, some of the Shiite militias from Iraq, uh, Hezbollah from Lebanon, but most importantly, the Russians came you know, and their air power has really turned the tide of the conflict. And so now, you know, then what happened is the uh, the, the the Sunni insurgents, the uh, the, the uh, jihadists, the Sunni jihadists, they started getting pushed back and they started being routed. And that's why, you know, the Saudi Arabia and Turkey and the Western powers were desperate for a ceasefire because at least that gives you know, some of the rebels breathing room, of course, uh, you know, ISIS was excluded from this agreement. Al Nusra Front was supposedly uh, excluded from this agreement, um, you know, with the ceasefire. But uh, so, you know, at, at least put a temporary pause in the action. And so and, you know, we've seen stories in recent days of how the U.S. is and, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey continue to funnel arms and supplies in to these groups, trying to rearm them, strengthen them again to, to, you know, continue the fight, you know, once the ceasefire ends. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, what Saudi Arabia said, Turkey has said, even the U.S., the Obama administration, they, they've said Assad must go either by peace or by force. So the long-term goals have not changed. Um, and so they, they want to remove Assad, they, they, I, but I think the reason they haven't invaded already is because the Russians are there and because Iran has been in there and they're concerned about starting World War Three uh, in the Middle East. And so they're, they want to get Assad out and they want to, you know, basically move Syria into the Sunni axis of power. But, uh, you know, I think Obama in particular, I think Saudi Arabia and Turkey already wanted to go in, but I think Obama is not he's been hesitant to give the green light because he he's not sure he wants to start world war three in, in syria but uh, the status quo is not acceptable long term so uh you know i believe that this ceasefire is only temporary do you think that they will use a false flag or some type of an event to justify going into syria well, yeah, I think that's quite, quite likely. I think we've already seen some a couple of false flags in Turkey where there were some bombings, then they blamed it on the Kurds, and it gave them justification to fire artillery and conduct airstrikes against the Kurds in northern Syria. And so I think we've already seen false flags, but I expect that we may see even more. And of course, anytime there's an attack by ISIS in the Western world, it shifts public opinion. All of a sudden people think, we need to do something about ISIS. Let's go get ISIS. Of course, ISIS is in Iraq, but it's also in Syria. And so then, you know, Western leaders start talking about, well, we're just going to have to, you know, go into Syria. We're going to have to do something. And, and the U.S. actually already has special forces inside Syria um, and, 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 you know, conducting attacks against ISIS and so forth. So, um, yeah, but, you know, so if 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 they are getting ready to conduct a massive ground invasion in Syria, make a major move, I would expect to see a false flag or multiple false flags to kind of move the needle of public opinion. And if this does happen, what does Russia do at this point? Are they going to sit by and say, well, OK, they're coming in? Or do you think this is going to escalate into a major war? 
Well, that's the big concern, and that's a big concern I have because, you know, of course, the Russian government is allied with the Assad regime, and if there's an invasion of Syria, the goal is not just to go in there and take a little bit of territory. The goal would be to make a push toward Damascus to take down Assad, to remove the Assad regime. That would be the goal of uh, if, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, backed by the Western powers, went in. That would be the goal. But Russia has already told Turkey, according to uh, one former Associated Press reporter, that Russia has informed Turkey that they're willing to use tactical nuclear weapons to defend Damascus. And so if that happened, if nuclear tactical nuclear weapons began to be used, that could potentially spark World War III in the Middle East. And of, of Saudi Arabia has nuclear weapons now, uh, I believe, and, and some top former U.S. military officials, among others, believe that Iran has nuclear weapons. Of course, the Western powers have nuclear weapons. You know, so if, nuclear, if, if somebody uses nuclear weapons, that opens up a whole huge can of worms. Um, and so... Uh, there's great concern. You know, what would Russia actually choose to do if uh, there was a full-blown ground invasion of Syria? I think it's a very open question. I think it's a major concern. And, and uh, you know, we could potentially, because of course, you know, Russia and Turkey have almost been in a state of war here in recent months, starting with the downing of the, the, the Russian fighter jet. Um, and, uh, you know, even if Russia and Turkey start shooting at one another, well, Turkey is a member of the NATO alliance. Could that pull in all the Western powers? I mean, there's just so much that could go wrong. What do you think is the objective of the U.S. right now with the economy coming down the way it is? The United States out in the Middle East and not really, you know, getting much done out there. What is their main objective here? I mean, is this... Is this to start a war? Is it to cover up the economic um, the economic collapse? I mean, what what is their end game here? Well, in Syria, the goal has always been to get rid of Assad, you know, um, and uh, so and that goal hasn't changed. But on a a broader level, I think Barack Obama is ma making moves. I don't think he he just wants to finish out his term quietly. I believe Barack Obama wants to make big moves. I think he wants to establish his legacy. I think that he wants to see a Democrat uh, follow him in office. Um, so, and I think Barack Obama has become so arrogant. He's He's becoming just more more pushy, more aggressive, whether it's China in the South China Sea, whether it's with Russia, you know, in Ukraine and elsewhere, whether it's in uh, global financial dealings, uh, you know, on so many fronts, Obama is getting more aggressive and he he uh, does not seem to, to be interested in ending his two terms quietly. In fact, I believe the most chaotic period of the Obama presidency is still ahead of us, if you can believe that. So I would watch Barack Obama closely because I think he realizes his time is short and what he's going, wants to do, uh, anything he wants to do, he knows he needs to do it very quickly. And so I would watch him very closely. Do you think that the economy, I mean, people have made predictions before, and I'm not asking you to look into a crystal ball and tell us, but from your research, uh, you've been researching a lot of the economic data, you've been looking at the economy, you've been looking at events around the world. Do you think we are getting very close at this point to the system starting to fall apart? Well, I think it's already happening, you know, whether you've got down in South America, you've got, uh, you know, the mainstream media is taught using the term economic collapse to describe what's going on over there. You know, you look down over in China from the peak of the market there, it's down more than 40 percent since the peak of the market in Japan. Their economy is basically a zombie at this point, And the natural disasters happening over there are making it worse. So globally, we're, I believe we've already entered what could be referred to as the next global recession. So in terms of the starting point, I believe we've already uh, uh, passed the starting point. The numbers continue to get worse all around the world month after month. Now here in the United States, things still seem pretty normal and, and, and regular. And in 
a large part because things here in the U.S. are are the downturn is not nearly as severe as it is in much of the rest of the world. So if you you know go to you know a number of places, if you go to Greece or you go to Brazil or Venezuela or many other areas around the world, and you say, "Oh, when's the economic downturn going to start?" They would just laugh at you. You know, they'd say, "Where have you been?" Here in the United States, you know, we're, we've been in better shape than much much of the rest of the world. But I, you know, I believe you know our problems will continue to escalate. As you know, we've already discussed so many of the numbers, which indicate things are going down, and many of the the big numbers have been going down since they peaked in late 2014. So things are sliding. It's not a full blown avalanche yet. And then there are other factors which could come into play, which could greatly accelerate. You know, so people can make their projections. But then, I mean, right now, we've got 38 volcanoes go, er, currently erupting right now around the world. We've Over the past week, we've seen a string of, of, of big earthquakes along the Ring of Fire, unlike anything we've seen in ages. You know, so if our planet is entering a period of increased instability, geolo- uh, seismic instability, you know, a single seismic event on the west coast of the United States in a major city in Japan or, you know, somewhere in the world in a heavily populated area could cause uh, markets to crash and cause global instability in the blink of an eye. So, yeah, things are already sliding, but, it, uh, you know, one, you know, black swan event, whether it's a, a terror attack using weapons of mass destruction, whether it's a major natural disaster or so many other things, so, some ma- type of major black swan event could could turn the slide into an avalanche very, very rapidly. Michael Snyder, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Yeah, the website I'm most known for is the economiccollapseblog.com, or if you just go to Google and type in the economic collapse, it's the first the result that comes up. Also, I hope people will check out my new book on Amazon.com entitled The Rapture Verdict. Today, you know, a lot of Christians know what's happening, know all these problems are coming, but the number one reason they're not getting prepared is because they there's this belief in a pre-tribulation rapture. If you're a Christian, you know what that refers to, where Christians, most Christians in the Western world believe they're going to get pulled out of here before anything really bad starts to happen. Well, in my new book, I very, very clearly and comprehensively show in 37 chapters that the Bible shows that this is not going to happen. Um, And and what I share is what actually the church taught for the first 1800 years. It's only in the last couple hundred years that this new doctrine has come in and kind of been adopted in the Western world. But uh, so if if people are interested in learning more, I hope they check it out. The the Rapture Verdict is on Amazon.com in paperback and also on the Kindle version. Michael, once again, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Led to severe shortages of food and basic supplies. If you go to the, into the stores in Venezuela, the store shelves are bare. Uh, chaos and rioting and looting, uh, you know, you basically got the gangs and the mafia are kind of taking control of things. It's kind of turning into the Wild West there in Venezuela as society totally unravels. Um, and, uh, you know, and so they're even worse than Brazil. But that's, you know, that's just South America. South America is essentially mired in this horrible depression, but it's just not South America. If you go over to Europe, and, you know, uh, the problems in Greece, of course, are continuing, but Greece is only the 44th largest economy on the entire planet. Italy is the eighth largest economy. And in Italy right now, the banking system is melting down. It looks like virtually all the banks over there are going to, all the big banks are going to need a bailout. They just had an, an emergency meeting one week ago in Rome. And then they said, what are we going to do about the banks? How are we going to rescue the banks? So they came up with this ridiculously small, uh, you know, uh, fund to try to help them. And, and it's really, you know, not going to do much good. But um, but basically, we're seeing a banking system meltdown in Italy, which, which is the eighth largest economy on the planet. So if they had so much trouble fixing Greece, you know, what are they going to do about Italy? How is Europe going to save Italy, which is, you know, the eighth largest economy on the planet? You mentioned riots and inflation do you see what's happening down in South America happening here in the United States? 
I do. I do. Uh, you know, as things unfold, that things go down the road because, you know, when people are hurting, when people mm -hmm. can't feed their families, when people don't know where their next meal is coming from, when people don't have jobs and there's really no prospect of getting a job, you know, people get desperate and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, um, when you combine that with the anger, the frustration, which are growing, which in recent years, a whole host of polls and surveys in the United States have shown um, anger and frustration in this country reach, you know, extremely high levels. So this is kind of analysts have said, well, 0.2, 0.4%, but right now they're projecting growth that's barely above zero. I have a feeling by the time the final number is comes in, we'll be actually in the negative. Our economy will be shrinking. Um, but uh, it's not just retail sales. Total business sales have fallen again. Um, we're seeing the inventory to sales ratio has risen to the highest level we've seen since the last recession. In other words, uh, retailers, dealers, they're sitting on lots and lots of stuff that's not selling. And so what they're doing, they're, they're ordering less stuff from the factories. In fact, factory orders in the United States have fallen for 16 months in a row. We never see this outside of a recession. We're seeing corporate uh, revenues fall, corporate earnings fall. In fact, it's being projected that the, for this corporate earnings reporting season on Wall Street, corporate earnings will be down an average of 8.5%, which is definitely in recession territory. Um, so we're seeing all these things and corporations are getting into trouble with their debt. Corporate debt defaults have spiked to the highest level since the last financial crisis. We're seeing uh, the average uh, rating on corporate debt has fallen to BB, the lowest level that we've seen, actually lower than at any point during the last financial crisis already. So, you know, all the underlying uh, uh, economic statistics, the economic fund fundamentals are just deteriorating. The, you know, our, the en en energy industry continues to fall apart. Dozens of energy companies have filed for bankruptcy. The U.S. oil rig count has fallen to the lowest level in 41 years. Um, you know, since the, the beginning of 2015, we've already lost more than 100,000 good paying energy jobs. So here in the United States, the economic fundamentals continue to deteriorate uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly. And yet, because the, the, you know, the stock market has been doing pretty good lately, people, you know, at least on a general level, people are feeling pretty good about things, but that's just here in the United States. We can also talk about what's going on in the rest of the world. Is the rest of the world doing as well as the United States, or do you see something, a, a completely different picture out side of the United yeah, a States. Completely different picture because all these numbers I just talked about were for the United States. But the thing is, is that right now, fortunately, the United States is pretty much doing better than almost everyone else on the planet. So let's take a quick look at what's going on around the planet. Let's start with down in South America, where you've got Brazil. They're the seventh largest economy on the entire planet. So they're a big deal. Well, in Brazil, uh, just a, a, a couple a few weeks ago, CNN ran this headline, quote, Brazil, economic collapse worse than feared. So not only are they admitting what's happening down in Brazil is an economic collapse, but they're saying it's even worse than we thought. So should we and, worry that they're using the word economic collapse now in their reporting? Because it was really yeah, the only it, the alternative media that was using economic collapse. Now the corporate media is using it. Yeah, that, you know, and I made a big point of this in a, in a recent article. It's like, you know, when the mainstream media, when CNN starts using that in their headlines, you know, that's time to start paying attention. It's, it, to me, it's a big deal. And of course, you know, impeachment proceedings are, are moving forward with the president down there. Unemployment is skyrocketing. Crime's getting out of control. People are really, really hurting uh, in Brazil. But in Venezuela, it's even worse. And you mentioned economic collapse in the in the headlines. Well, in the in Independent, which is one of the biggest uh, news sources in the UK, they use economic collapse in their headline to describe what's happening in Venezuela. Um, and uh, basically, the, the, the gist of that story was that what's going to collapse, totally collapse first, the government or the economy. What's happening down in Venezuela is Basically, we're seeing the end game of printing money like crazy, which we can talk about later in this show, what's happening in the Western world. But in, in Venezuela, uh, one measure of inflation is at 720 percent. 
um, you know, and this has led to food shortages because people get in, actually get some money. They want to go to the stores immediately and buy some food or whatever, because, you know, they just know that tomorrow or the next week prices are going to be even so much higher. So if they actually get some money. They want to spend it immediately. It's kind of what happened in the Weimar Republic in, in Germany in the 1930s. So this is really appreciated. I wanted to know right now, we started out this year where the market was down. Things weren't going that well. And everyone thought, OK, here we are. The whole thing's starting to collapse at this point. And it, we see this slide going down, down, down. And then all of a sudden, we see the economy, not the economy, I shouldn't say the economy, I should say the stock market improve because all the other indicators are showing us something different. Has everything been fixed at this point? Is everything okay right now? Or do you see a completely different picture of what's going on? I do see a completely different picture. I, uh, you know, let's go back to the middle of last year. You know, all of a sudden we get to August and we see the greatest financial shaking that we had seen since the last financial crisis. Markets all over the world started to crash. Things went crazy. And then all of a sudden, you know, then the market started recovering, particularly here in the United States, although some of the markets around the world didn't really recover here in the United States. The stock market started to go back up. So people said, oh, you know, the crisis is over. Things are you know, going to be okay. Then we get to the beginning of this year, January and, and the very beginning of February, markets all over the world start crashing again. It's even worse. And the markets go even lower at one point, sixteen and a half trillion dollars had been wiped out from stock markets all over the world. But now markets have gone back up, particularly in the United States, uh, uh, close, you know, uh, rebounded qu quite nicely. And so people think, well, it was just some temporary shakings, no big deal. The crisis is over as if the stock market's some type of barometer for the economy. But let's kind of go around the world and, and look at everything that's done. But let's start here in the United States. We just learned that retail sales unexpectedly declined <laughs> Uh, last month, that was that was unexpected, but that's something we would expect to see if we were indeed heading toward, or had already entered a recession, which I believe that we have. In fact, uh, you know, the Atlanta Fed is projecting uh, GDP growth of zero point one percent. You know, other uh, uh, bubbling under the surface. The general population is angry. We see it kind of in the in the uh, candidate candidacies of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, where people are wanting establishment, you know, uh, uh, candidates that are not part of the establishment. They're angry about what's going on in Washington, D.C. They want to do something. So they're like, give us someone else. Um, and you combine that with, uh, you know, how our borders are wide open, where we've got uh, people, you know, coming up through the southern border in particular unchecked. And this has led to a uh, fueling of, uh, for example, the FBI says we've now got 1.4 million gang members living in our cities, major cities, 100,000 in the city of Chicago alone. This has been primarily fueled by in illegal immigration, which has been, uh, you know, fueling the growth of these gangs. Um, and then, of course, you've got the radical left with uh, whether it's the, the, you know, we've seen in, in Ferguson, Baltimore, we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen with, you know, these uh, protests at Trump rallies, uh, where there's so much anger and frustration from the far left. And, you know, all these factors put together, you know, basically the conditions are really ideal for some real, so from, for uh, civil unrest on a nationwide basis. All it's going to take is a spark. And of course, Trump is kind of providing that spark on a political level, but also as economic conditions really start to head downhill, um, particularly once the financial markets completely melt down, I think that people are going to get angry and frustrated and they're not going to, they're not going to act out in a responsible manner. Now we see across Europe and Japan, they're in negative interest rates right now. And we see here in the United States, they raise the interest rate. But you had an interesting article about the central banks distributing money directly to the people. At this point, I mean, is this the last bullet they have to shoot to say, okay, let's try this and see if see what happens. If we give money to the people, maybe this will help the economy. Do you think this is going to help the economy, them giving money to the people? 